Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Lewis Schiff, who's the Executive Director of Moonshots and Moneymakers. Lewis, welcome to the program. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. Hey, so I want to hear all about your entrepreneurial journey and background, um, and then we want to dive right into, first of all, what in the world is a moonshot and moneymaker. So give us a little bit of a, a, a flavor of your entrepreneurial journey up to this point in your career. Well, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I've spent a lot of years around entrepreneurs, so I can explain it like this. I built and sold two businesses to publicly traded companies. <clears throat> that's important because people want to know that you started something and that you ended something. Um, I also always add to that story that um, I don't really know how I did it, meaning I was kind of thoughtlessly plundering through the world of entrepreneurship in my mid-20s and early 30s, and I had a few successes. I subsequently started writing books about entrepreneurship because I came so, became so fascinated with the topic, ended up spending time with some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, and have completely changed or learned what it really takes to build a really great company that genuinely has enterprise value. And so when I look back at the fact that I built two uh, companies that I sold for a lot of money, I'm almost left like scratching my head, you know, how did I do that? Uh, kind of got lucky. And now I understand I teach entrepreneurship. I'm, I'm uh, launching a new company that's um, you know, gonna be, I think probably a unicorn the way we're going. And I started a conference to teach all this stuff, which was called Moonshots and Money Makers. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 I think sometimes people hear conceptually about an issue or an, uh, a trend, and maybe they just kind of take the surface level sound bite headlines and form an mm -hmm. opinion on that. So I think diving in deep with things like that really just help to bring light to the issue and clarify, right? Is that what you've, you found as well? Yeah. I mean, there's like multiple stages to the entrepreneurial journey. So, you know, as I said, people want just to have credibility. They want to hear that you went from the beginning to the end. But what's really interesting for me these days is um, I'm simultaneously teaching to some very big business owners. I mean, the school I run called Birthing of Giants is teaching to owners of businesses with 50 and 100 and 300 and 500 million dollars in revenue, pretty successful businesses. And the business owners are the students. So then we took Moonshots and Moneymakers, this conference we developed with Oxford University, and we hold it in, in the UK. And it's really, you know, you may not be that $100 million company owner, you may be anywhere else in the journey. And we're, we're showing you what we do successfully with these big companies. And then just to add to that whole thing, I'm also building one of those companies right now. So I'm teaching it, building it, showing people how to do it. Yeah. You know, because then no one can say, oh, well, you're just the teacher, not the doer. And, you know, people that are teachers are the ones that failed. It. Well, you know what? Guess what? I might have failed here, but I learned from it. I got up and I iterated and tweaked and fine tuned. So I think that makes a whole lot of sense. I really uh, resonate with that. What do you feel? Um, what do you feel some of the issues are with um, maybe like innovators and innovations? What is stopping innovators from moving forward and succeeding in the way that they are looking for? Sure. That's a great question because it, what I'm about to say is really counterintuitive and you kind of have to go down my rabbit hole, which we may or may not want to do today. But the truth is there's this vast message that's put out to everyone that they should go out and raise money to start their business. And that sentence is broken, man. That is really broken because that, that sentence, I'm starting a business, so I'm going to raise money is a sentence that is created or brought to you by the people with money, <laughs> you know, venture capital, yep. angels, private equity, you know, family office, corporate MA, like they're all, they're the source of that sentence. So what they've done is they've written, you know, they have this story promoted to a lot of really bright and innovative and hardworking people that, oh, you have an idea, you can't start until you raise a quarter million or a million dollars, which is really, and this is a very cynical way to put it, but it's really a way of saying, you have a great idea that you're willing to bust your hump to make happen. Well, before you do, I want to own a chunk of that for very, very little money. Now, if you heard it that way, you'd say, that doesn't sound like a good deal for me. 
But that's not the story. The story is, uh, and I hang out with entrepreneurs all the time, as I'm sure you do, is, oh, you're raising money? Did you raise the money? How much money did you raise? And that is not a healthy way to start a company. Huh. Because isn't it kind of like back in the 90s where you could raise a trillion gazillion dollars on the back of a napkin, you know, the internet dot com, which led to the dot bomb and <laughs> raising money, air quotes, is sometimes just the tip of the iceberg and its surface. Whereas what if you had to do a little bootstrapping and put a little bit of, you know, uh, you know, flesh in the game? Now, all of a sudden, it's like, ooh, well, is this a wise move to hire this whole team of? Because what would the ramifications? Maybe maybe you treat ROI a little bit differently if you had, had to, like, put your own money in, that kind of thing. A hundred percent. A hundred percent, Mike. And the idea is um, there's a word that, you know, people have learned the word raising money, which is a fairly complicated yeah. concept. They, they learn that phrase. They haven't learned the word dilution. And dilution yeah. is when someone says, hey, I'll put a million dollars into your startup but I want 80% of the company for it. Well, now you only yeah. have 20% left. Imagine it's five years down the road and your company has been phenomenally successful, but in addition to that million, you had to raise another few million and you kept getting diluted and now you own 5% of the company. Well, guess what? You have a $100 million company. What a success story, but you only own $5 million of it. And guess what? After you pay your taxes on that 5 million, you got to go out and get a job because you can't well, pay your mortgage with what's left. It, it, it's almost like when you when you juxtaposition that statement over to what we see every week on Shark Tank. I'm a religious watcher of Shark Tank, and my family is. And I can go, um, you know, even my my kids that are you know teenagers and early twenties, um, they can go, oh hey, um, we're looking for a hundred thousand dollars, ten percent, and I'll go, what's the valuation of the company? They're like a million. Um, but anyway, you know what a scary term is. Burn rate, and when you get asked what's yeah. your burn rate, they're like, "Oh, twenty thousand a month." It's like, "Hold up, that means you're you're burning through that and going under." If if you're a home equity and your personal savings and your four hundred one k on the line, would you be burning through that? Wow, probably not. Right, right. And so this is the lesson of moonshots and money makers, Mike. Is that the work I do with entrepreneurs who have companies with 10 and 50 and a hundred million dollars, and they personally make a million or two or $3 million a year and they live very well, but also they have a lot of um, uh, satisfaction from their work. You know, it's not all about money. They're the boss. They get to be creative. They are the masters of their own domain. It's pretty exciting stuff. Um, what they're doing to create those one and two and $3 million annual salaries and those companies that are worth 50 to $500 million dollars is they are starting, just as you said, bootstrapping. But what's been happening is that they're pivoting from that kind of company, that bootstrap company, which we call money makers, companies that make money, perish the yeah. thought that your company makes money. Yeah. Um, and we're showing them how to pivot. Actually, I shouldn't say it that way. They showed us how they pivot from a money maker, which is a traditionally valued company, a company that runs in a way that probably the outside world would say, well, I'll pay you a multiple of the profits in order to buy this company from you. We're showing us how they were pivoting into moonshots. And moonshots are companies where outside buyers say, this company has such growth potential, I'm valuing it as a multiple of revenue, not a multiple of earnings. In other words, if you have a $10 million company with a $1 million profit earnings, uh, and someone came along and said, I'll pay you five times profit, that's $1 million of profit times five, $5 million for that company. But if you're in a space that's growing so much that the, the idea of profit is really not important right now because there's so much opportunity, they might look at that same $10 million company and they say, I'll pay you five times revenue. Now that's a $50 million company. And the question everyone in our world from the moneymaker to moonshot world, which we, this conference at Oxford is, how do I turn my moneymaker into a moonshot? Or if I haven't started anything at all, how do I conceive of my moonshot in a way where I have to go from two steps, moneymaker and then moonshot, because I'm trying to prevent dilution. When I sell that company, I want to own as much of it as possible. So how does a moonshot relate to or compare to a unicorn? Yes, that's a very similar language, and they are similar. I mean, um, in Birthing a Giants program, we've had people come in with pretty small companies that were worth nothing, but then they made these underlying changes under the hood and they became unicorn companies. So unicorn company is very specifically a company that has a, a valuation of $1 billion or more. 
But a, a moonshot, I mean, and, and you and I would probably be very happy if we sold our company for a billion dollars and we own a <laughs> lot of it. <laughs> but we'd probably be pretty happy if we sold our companies for $500 million and we owned a lot of it too. So the, the unicorn is a very specific billion dollar level. But a moonshot is anything like that. In other words, a company that's valued as a multiple of revenue that's worth 500 million, a billion, 10 billion, you know, it can go in any, it can go as high as you can think. Um, but moonshots are defined as companies that would be valued by the outside world as a multiple of revenue because the potential is so great. We're not really worried about profits right now. We're because there's substance growing. there. Yeah, there's, they're, they're playing into a secular trend. Yeah. So the example I use all the time is, Imagine you have a catering business in your town. Imagine you, you're pretty big and you've got a $5 million catering business. And so your clients are corporations in your area and weddings and things like that. $5 million, here's what you have. You have a kitchen that's got all the health codes up to date, a staff that knows how to run it, trucks to move that food around. That's a moneymaker business. That's a business that makes money. Now, what if you threw Postmates, Grubhub, Uber Eats, et cetera, et cetera, on top of it, it's now gone from being a corporate catering kitchen to what we call a ghost kitchen. And the secular trend towards getting food delivered by app is so great that the outside world doesn't really care if that ghost kitchen's making profit right now because they think the growth potential is so much. The only yeah. difference between your corporate catering business and your ghost kitchen is the way you take in business, you know? Um, and so yet ghost kitchen looks to the outside world like it's a hamburger joint and a Chinese food restaurant and an Italian restaurant because it's all the same things being cooked out of the same kitchen. But that's exactly what a corporate catering kitchen does too. They cook 10 different kinds of food out of the same kitchen. So one's a moneymaker and one's a moonshot. Mike, do I lose you? Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you, what you're saying. And what makes me think is, well, where do you, where do you get money these days and why should you get it to do put it in the right yeah. spot so that you're viewed as a moonshot and not just, you know, let it go up in smoke. Yeah. And I, and I'm not saying you don't want to raise money. You definitely want to raise money. You just want to postpone raising money as long as possible. So who's better to raise money from? Well, venture capitalists want you to do something very specific. They want you to build businesses. that are going to grow because they own a piece of it. Maybe they own 20%, maybe 50, maybe 80, but they own a chunk of it. But remember, there's an amount left. If they own 20 and you own 80, and the, and the company's gonna need five more million dollars to reach its goal, they're gonna try and use that five million dollars to get as much of the 80% that you own from you into their pocket. Why wouldn't they? That makes yep. sense. Yeah. So, so that's their goal. So I think you wanna wait as long as possible before you raise money. I think there's a new source of money now that's very interesting. The old source is called private equity, and all these lines are getting blurred. Venture capital are acting like private equity. Private equity is acting like venture capital. But you need to understand the capital markets. Um, and then the new source of money that's super interesting is called family offices, which are essentially rich people who have made so much money that they just basically hire one or two or three or four people to go out and look for deals. They're, kind of, they're friendly to entrepreneurs because they're typically entrepreneurs themselves. But the, yeah. the, the fundamental truth about money when it comes to entrepreneurship is that there's way too much money out there and they're desperately looking for ways to deploy it. And you might say, well, why would they be desperate? I mean, so you got a billion dollars in the bank and you can't deploy it. What, you know, okay, so you, do, you don't deploy it. No, that's not how the capital markets work. Capital markets are a series of structures where let's say a teacher's retirement fund has a billion dollars in the bank and they have to pay for the retirement of a thousand teachers. Well, they have to make that money grow at a certain rate. So they put a little bit in the bank, they put a little bit with blue chip companies, they put a little bit with private equity, a little bit with venture capital, so on and so forth. And every one of those institutions has an obligation to the, to the teacher's retirement fund, which is, I'm going to make sure that you have this money back when those teachers retire. So there'll be like a five-year clock on the money or a 10-year clock. So once they give that money to, to the venture capital fund, the clock is ticking and they only got 10 years to deploy it. Now, nine years, now eight years. Think about it from the company they're investing in. Maybe they only have seven years left to return that money to the teacher's fund when they finally invest in your company. That means they've got a seven-year clock on you selling your business. Now, you may say, no, I need 10 years. Well, they don't care. They yep. need seven years. So their agenda becomes your agenda. And their agenda becomes your agenda because of the teacher's pension fund, which, by the way, you don't even know those people in the teacher's pension fund. Right. So now your company's future and destiny 
is being determined by an organization that you don't even know about. That's where it gets all wacky. Yeah. So what's the solution? The solution is very, <laughs> it's, it's build a moneymaker. So, you know, I talk about this. Here's the simplest way of looking at it. You want to start a company, start a small company that solves a problem for a larger industry. Okay. Kind of like the corporate catering example. They need food. So start a small company that solves a problem for a larger industry. Then you'll notice that when you start, you're that small company solving a problem for a larger industry, you're probably doing it by solving three problems. You're taking on labor so that the larger industry doesn't have to. You're deploying technology a little bit more cleverly and less expensively with less cyber risk than that larger company or the larger industry has to. And the truth is, the dirty little secret is you're actually kind of a bank to that larger industry. Because if you have 10 people working for you that you pay by you know twice to a month, well, your client's paying you every 30 or 60 days. That float is actually serving as a bank. Mm-hmm. So those, so start a small company that solves those three problems for larger industries, um, solves a problem for larger industries by addressing labor, technology, and, and finance. Then once you're in that business, you know that business, you've got a team that's helping you, a reputation and a brand, you now pivot to figuring out how you can solve your labor problem, your technology problem, and your financing problem. And once you solve those three problems, you've actually pivoted from a moneymaker to a moonshot. Yeah. So start with a moneymaker, then take five years and pivot to a moonshot. Then once you've figured out what your moonshot is, then raise money from venture capital, from mm-hmm. private equity, but on much, much, much better terms. Because you've done it the right way. You've created the solid foundation. You did ready, aim, fire, not fire, fire, ready, ready, aim, maybe, possibly. So (laughs) you've done it the right way. So good. And then, of course, your um, uh, birthing of giants and your programs and your teachings uh, help guide people through that process. Yes. So we started this program at Oxford University called Moonshots and Money Makers. Now everybody knows what that means. Um, The Oxford Innovation Conference for American Entrepreneurs. And we basically spend five days breaking down how do you build a moonshot? How do you build a unicorn? Um, and I mentioned at the top of this, I'm doing one right now, and I'm basically starting my own company, which is designed to be a unicorn, and I'm writing about it and teaching people about it. But it's not just me. You know, I've got so many people, we've got so many people coming to the Oxford Conference who have done this themselves. So if somebody wants to learn how to turn a money maker, how to build a moneymaker and how to pivot into a moonshot, in other words, how to follow the most reliable path to creating wealth in America, that's what this program is about. Awesome. And people can learn more at your website, birthingofgiants.com, and I'll make sure to have that uh, hot linked in the show notes. Any other uh, points there on the website that people could learn from or you could direct them to? Yeah, we have just launched birthingofgiants.com's How I Did It. How I Did It. So How I Did It is a video um, site that basically you can watch the videos of all the people who have built money makers and pivoted to moonshot. So even if you just want to do this from the comfort of your own home and it's free and we're just telling the story far and wide. I love it. Well, Lewis, thanks so much for coming on. It's a real pleasure talking with you today. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate your time. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.